I'm next in the broadcast. Despite Washington's recent sanctions against Pyongyang, South Korea says it's standing by its offer for talks with North Korea. We delve more into the issue in the first part of our 2015 Outlook series. Indonesia vows to continue its search for the wreckage of the Air Asia flight to Singapore that went down in the Java Sea as visibility hinders recovery efforts. The latest figures show 2014 was a mixed bag for the Korean labor market. Though job opportunities boomed, most openings were for part-time positions for those in their 50s and 60s. Primetime News begins now. Welcome to the program. Hope your week is off to a great start. Live from Seoul, I'm Sean Lim. And I'm Kang Tae-ri. Thank you very much for tuning in to Primetime News tonight. Now we begin with the spillover effect of Washington's latest actions on Pyongyang. North Korea says the U.S. sanctions against the regime are a typical way of Washington showing hostility against them. However, South Korea still awaits North Korea's response on possible inter-Korean talks after there was some glimmer of hope. Our Connie Lee starts us off. South Korea aims to push ahead with plans for inter-Korean talks, despite the recent flare-up and tension between North Korea and the United States. The spokesperson from Seoul's Unification Ministry says its proposal for high-level talks with Pyongyang remains on the table, despite Washington's announcement of sanctions against the North. The country's state-run media lashed out at the U.S. on Sunday, saying the new sanctions clearly demonstrate Washington's hostility toward the regime. The policy persistently pursued by the U.S. to stifle North Korea, groundlessly stirring up bad blood towards it, would only harden its will and resolution to defend the sovereignty of the country. The U.S. has slapped new sanctions on three North Korean organizations and 10 individuals for Pyongyang's alleged cyber attack on Sony Pictures, which produced the film The Interview, an interview a comedy about an assassination up. attempt on North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. However, as North Korea intensified its rhetoric against the U.S., the communist state has not criticized the South as usual with verbal attacks. Pyongyang's main newspaper, the Rorong Shinmun, reported no criticism of Seoul on Sunday. And North Korea's propaganda website, Uri Minjokiri, stated that the two Koreas should work together. Experts say North Korea has a motive. By improving relations with South Korea, North Korea wants to show that the U.S. sanctions will be ineffective. In the meantime, South Korea continues to wait on North Korea to respond to its earlier proposal for talks. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And all these moves come after the leaders of the two Koreas opened the new year by expressing a willingness to improve inter-Korean relations. Exactly. All eyes are on whether this will actually evolve into an easing of tensions on the Korean Peninsula. And to tell us more, of course, our Hwang sung -hee joins us right here in the studio. So, sung let's start off with a recap of the situation between the North and the South. There's a lot of uh, uh, touch and go here. That's right. Both Koreas definitely seem to be in the mood for talks. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in his New Year's speech um, made an apparent proposal for a summit. We were expecting him to express a willingness to improve inter-Korean ties, but this was not really expected. Um, let's take a look. And for us to hold back from the highest level talks, we will put our utmost efforts to, for practical progress in dialogue and negotiations. Now, this, of course, came just three days after South Korea made an offer for talks. South Korean Unification Minister Ryu gil -jae again reiterated Seoul's hopes for any form of dialogue with Pyongyang following Kim's speech. Mm. What about Washington's uh, fresh round of sanctions on North Korea this time around? How is this going to affect this momentum for the two Koreas? Well, yes, despite this momentum, South Korea's foreign ministry called the sanctions an appropriate response, saying such sanctions cyber attacks that damage private interests cannot be tolerated. Now, some say this could kill any momentum for talks, but others say North Korea is well, focusing more on targeting Washington. 
At this stage, North Korea is using a two-sided strategy by pressuring the U.S. to stay out of issues related to the Korean Peninsula and creating a mood for dialogue with the South. And as we saw in Connie's report, uh, North Korea has been dishing out criticisms of the U.S. over the last few days, but it has not made one single negative comment about South Korea. Right. Certainly, uh, 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 momentum continues in that direction. But what could come in the way of uh, improving inter-Korean talks? Well, Sean, there are two key events in the first half of this year to watch out for. South Korea and the U.S. are expected to hold a joint military drills uh, sometime later in February, which could raise tensions back on the Korean Peninsula. Now, North Korea has always, always protested the drills, and also in his New Year's speech, Kim Jong-un demanded that Seoul call off the plans. Another potential source of contention is the opening of a U.N. human rights office here in Seoul in March. Still, many analysts don't expect Pyongyang to launch a provocation so soon. There's nothing particular on the horizon that North Korea would have to respond to. So I think in many ways we're still on the positive part of the cycle. So I don't, I don't anticipate too many provocations from the North. But of course you never know. Well, analysts say the next 50 days will be crucial. Now, that's time leading up to the joint drills. If the two Koreas fail to make progress, uh, then North Korea could take action on its nuclear threats. Mm, so that's uh, the next uh, 50 days that you're talking about. What about this whole year? What kind of year is it going to be for the two Koreas and their relations? Well, Kim Jong-un will try to seek a breakthrough from its diplomatic isolation through mm. South Korea. President Park Geun-hye will want to make some progress in relations with North Korea in her third year in office. Analysts don't expect a summit right away, but definitely more dialogue at the lower levels to discuss the issues of reunion for war separated families, the lifting of sanctions, and the resumption of South Korean tours to Mount Kumgang. There could also be more joint cultural events to mark the 70th year of independence and the 70th year of the division of the Korean Peninsula. We're also waiting to see if the two leaders uh, will accept Russia's invitation to its 70th anniversary of the end of the World War II, although many doubt to see the two leaders in Moscow together in May. So still definitely some hope there, but much still hangs on uh, some uncertainty. Thank you so much, Songi, for joining us tonight. My pleasure. political scandal that's been brewing for weeks now here in Korea appears to have no legs. The prosecution's preliminary results have determined that what they found in the recently leaked presidential documents was false. Our Kwanzaa has the details. Prosecutors have indicted a former presidential secretary on charges that he had ordered a leak of confidential documents from the presidential office. They found the documents to be fake. We have conducted a broad investigation and found the documents to be false. The scandal dating back to November with a local report alleging that President Park Geun-hye's former aide Jung yun hye held secret meetings with presidential secretaries seeking to drive out the current presidential chief of staff. Prosecutors say the meetings never happened. The scandal has stirred up the political arena in recent weeks and aroused criticism from the public, who want more transparency at the presidential office. And over the prosecution's preliminary announcement on Monday, Korea's rival political parties continued with their clash. The ruling party said the suspicions were absurd to begin with. This is a breach of code of conduct that involved unverified information reported in a presidential document which led to chaos. The main opposition party said no one will trust in the probe's conclusion, calling for a special investigation into the case. The prosecution has come up with a conclusion customized to the presidential office. The truth hasn't been revealed. The presidential office of Tongade says it won't be making an official comment on the prosecution's findings. Kwon Arirang News. 
New efforts by Japan to continue its false claims to the waters between Korea and Japan. And this time, their government is using the story of sea lions and the Tokyo Islands to indoctrinate elementary students. Our Son Jung-in explains how the move also comes as Japan wants to develop energy sources in the region. This is a video released by the Japanese government titled Islands Once the Home of Mechi or Sea Lions. The author of a book with the same title teaches elementary school students that Korea's easternmost islets of Tokdo, Takeshima as it's known in Japan, was the habitat of sea lions where Japanese fishermen used to catch fish. Children playing with sea lions dreamed of becoming a fisherman so they could catch fish in Takeshima. The 17-minute-long video was uploaded onto YouTube by an office affiliated to the Japanese cabinet. It will be used as elementary school material to teach children that Tokdo is Japanese territory. Japan's Takashima is waiting for us beyond the waves. The Japanese government has been intensifying its history distortion by making unjustified claims to Tokdo. In 2013, Tokyo distributed a video claiming sovereignty over Korea's islets, and last year it stated in elementary school textbooks that Korea is illegally occupying the territory. In 1905, the Japanese government reaffirmed its intention to claim sovereignty over Takeshima by a cabinet decision. It's not stopping there either. Along with its persistent promotional activities, Japan is also aiming to secure the abundant resources the islets offer. Tokyo plans to invest some 18 million U.S. dollars to carry out research on methane hydrate in the East Sea. Studies suggest some 600 million tons of the future energy resource is located around Tokyo. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. And speaking of the territorial tensions, the CIA World Factbook isn't helping matters. After its recent update, there's no reference to Tokto Island when you click on the CIA's map of Korea. But when clicking on the map of Japan, you'll find the Tokto Islets marked as the Lian Court Rocks, a name which some people view as neutral. Up until now, the CIA had listed Tokto in both versions of the map as the Lian Court Rocks. The factbook says both South, uh, South Korea and Japan claim the rocky islets, which have been Korea controlled since 1954. The CIA has provided no indication as to why the change was made, but analysts believe it may be the result of lobbying by Japan, which has been trying to assert its claims to Tokto through the international community. Seoul's foreign ministry says that it's making efforts to get the CIA to put Tokto back on the Korean map. Concerns are rising over a potential diplomatic row between South Korea and China after Chinese authorities notified Seoul that a Korean national had been executed for drug-related offenses. Our Kim ji tells us more. Korea's foreign ministry said Beijing notified Seoul on Monday that a Korean national surnamed Kim had been executed for drug-related offenses, where it came six days after the death sentence was carried out. Beijing said the late notice was due to year-end administrative delays. Ministry officials in Seoul are calling Beijing's move incomprehensible, given that they had repeatedly asked their Chinese counterparts for clemency on Kim's behalf. In a statement on Monday, Seoul said it regrets the execution took place, despite numerous requests to Beijing to refrain from carrying out the death sentence on humanitarian grounds. It added that it plans to beef up cooperation with related countries to further prevent Korean citizens from being involved in drug-related crimes. Kim's execution is putting into question the effectiveness of a consul pact between Korea and China that was signed in July and awaits ratification in Korea. Under the pact, the two sides agreed to notify the other country within four days when a national of that country is held in custody and immediately if it involves death row. This is not the first time a Korean national has been sentenced to death in Chinese territory for drug offenses. In 2001, a 41-year-old surname Shin was executed for smuggling and trading drugs. Kim is the fourth Korean national that China has executed for drug offenses since last year. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. 
The number of jobs created last year in Korea hit a record high, not seen since 2002. But zoom in for a closer look, and it's not all that encouraging. Most of that number entails part time contract positions and more jobs for those in their 50s and 60s rather than the younger workforce. Our Connie Kim has the details. Statistics Korea says an average of 543,000 new jobs were created each month between January and November of 2014, which is the highest in 12 years. The country's employment rate also topped 65 percent last year, up nearly a percentage point from the previous year. And while the figures are encouraging, the state of the employment market is not. Young people in their 20s and 30s continue to struggle to find work. 20-somethings took up just over a tenth of those who got new jobs last year. Those in their 30s fared worse, recording an average 20,000 less jobs per month. In contrast, people in their 50s and 60s accounted for more than four-fifths of new jobs created in the 11 months. Compounding concerns is the fact that more than a third of the labor market, more than six million people, are contract workers. And to tackle that issue, the government has proposed plans to improve working conditions for them. This includes extending the contract period for temporary workers who are 35 and older to four years from the current two. Analysts have also called for fundamental reforms to the current wage system that hands out raises to individuals based on how long they've been working, regardless of the quality of their work. The OECD says Korea has the sixth most complicated procedures among member countries for laying off a regular worker. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Latest figures show Korea is still the most ramyun slurping nation per capita. The birth of ramyun in Korea came with Samyang foods in the 1960s. It was considered a quick, cheap, and tasty meal substitute. But that image has been slowly changing with more ramyun firms trying to tap into overseas markets. Our, our uh, Shin Se-min has more on this country's instant noodle market. The average Korean slurps up on 74 packets of ramyun or instant noodles every year. Now that breaks down to one packet every five days. Now, Korean ramen companies are exporting their products to every corner of the world so you can have a taste of Korean ramen. Three minutes is all you need to get it ready. Widely known for being packed with calories and carbohydrates, but still loved by the masses, Korean ramen is embedded in the culture. The concept of ramen was first introduced by Samyang Foods in the early 1960s as a means to feed those suffering from food shortages. The packet with high nutrition was a quick solution to many Koreans' malnourished stomachs. In the 60 years since, ramen has become a comfort food for many Koreans. It's a little fattening, but it's hard to resist, so I keep coming back. It's convenient and tasty. I think I eat ramen two or three times a week, and I'm not sick of it at all. The flavor of ramen can be played around with. It's spicy, and you can add in vegetables or seafood for a different taste. It's one of the reasons many consumers like Korean ramen. Domestically, the ramen market grew to 1.8 billion U.S. dollars, up 500 million in just past five years. Korean ramen makers didn't stop there. They're expanding overseas. The noodles can now be found in some 120 countries worldwide. Ramen itself takes up 18 percent of all agricultural and food exports. A lot of factors come into play. The Korean wave is one. It caught one in the Chinese market, which is now the largest overseas consumer of Korean ramen. The road to success hasn't been without obstacles. Various regulations in certain countries once kept ramen makers out of foreign markets. Take Turkey, for example. Samyang was barred from introducing its ramen product in the country due to Turkish regulations on the labeling of GMO food products. And in the U.S., strict food import regulations that contain beef hindered the export of Korean-made ramen. But that problem was solved by setting up a local factory. Reaching out to different markets is always a challenge, but we continue to explore customers with different backgrounds. For instance, we are working on entering the African and European markets now. 
Samyang Food Corporation wants ramen to become a household name throughout the world. And until the company is able to bypass the obstacles to entering the untapped markets, there are experimentations with the flavors of Korean ramen that will suit foreign palates is an ongoing project. Shin Samin, Arirang News. Indonesia has vowed to continue the search for the wreckage of the Air Asia plane that crashed in the Java Sea, despite extreme weather conditions hampering the international re recovery effort. For more, we turn to Paul Yi at the News Center. Paul, tell us what kind of challenges do these search crews face? Well, Indonesia's military and maritime police say they face unpredictable weather, strong winds, and rough seas in the main search area off the coast of Borneo. The harsh conditions have forced officials to suspend the recovery operation at this time. This as three additional bodies were recovered on this money, Monday, rather, bringing the confirmed count to 37. Teams are struggling to find the plane's black box amid fears other parts of the jetliner may have been swept away, along with the other victims. The Indonesian National Army will work hard and cooperate with the countries that are involved. We will not give in to the operation area's environment, which could be windy and hold strong waves. The teams are working hard in spite of their own safety. Indonesia's weather agency said the plane's engine may have stalled due to icy conditions in the air, citing initial analysis. AirAsia Flight 8501 went missing on December 28th while traveling from Surabaya to Singapore. And shifting to the Vatican, Pope Francis has named a group of 20 new cardinals from around the world in a welcome move to bring more diversity into the Roman Catholic Church. Myanmar, Tonga and Cape Verde saw a clergy named a cardinal post for the first time. There were also appointees from New Zealand, Ethiopia and Panama, representing nearly every continent on the globe. Pope Francis read out the new list of cardinals on Sunday before thousands of visitors at St. Peter's Square. And turning to the United States, police in New York and across the country have paid their respects to fellow officer Wen Jian Lu, who was killed last month in the line of duty. The 32-year-old Chinese-American was shot point-blank along with his partner Rafael Ramos by a gunman who said he was avenging police aggression against black men. During the service on Sunday, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio honored the victims in a eulogy. At the same time, though, hundreds of uniformed officers outside turned their backs to the video screen showing the mayor in a silent protest. Many in the NYPD have resented what they saw as de Blasio's sympathy for anti-police protesters in recent months. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello and welcome, I'm Steven Che with a look at sports. Starting over in Spain, La Liga Giants Real Madrid were on a historic 22-match winning streak until they ran into Valencia, a team that's proven hard to beat on home turf. The visiting Galacticos took the lead early on a Cristiano Ronaldo penalty and stayed aggressive throughout. But Valencia, with a single loss at home this season, scored twice in the second half, stunning the Spanish league leaders 2-1. to one. Real Madrid still topped the standings, though, by a point over Barcelona and Atletico Madrid. And coming closer to home, let's go to the KBL hardcourt in Pusan, with the KT Sonic Boom taking on the Mobis Phoebus. A one-point game early on turns into a nine-point Sonic Boom lead by the half. Cho Song Min scores 29 points, and Charles Rhodes ends with the rebound, or rather ends a rebound shy of a triple double as KT wins with authority. Over to pro volleyball in the, P in the V League in Incheon, the Korean Air Jumbos played host to the LIG Graders. And the Jumbos were 2 and 1 against the Graders going into the matchup this season, and they start the match up two sets to one before Michael Sanchez in the fourth ends it with a thunderous spike to earn their 12th victory of the season. 
Across the Pacific, the 2015 Dakar Rally kicked off in South America with motorcycles, cars, quads, and trucks ripping across the harsh terrain. The first stage opened with a or with an 838-kilometer course starting at Argentina's capital of Buenos Aires. Each stage is split into the road and special sections, the latter of which is timed to rank the competition. Two marathon stages and a single rest day lie ahead in the 12 stages ahead. That's all I have for sports. Stay tuned for the weather up next. Have a good night. Hope your week is off to a great start. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with your weather updates. It was a smoggy day nationwide due to fine dust from China and levels continue to remain high in some places. But snow and showers overnight will help wash away the toxic particles. Rain is forecast to hit Seoul first before spreading to other regions. And keep in mind that snow may fall in areas where temperatures remain low. The system will pull down tomorrow's numbers and the morning low here in the capital will dip to minus 4 degrees, which is about 3 degrees lower than today. Looking ahead, brace yourselves for another cold snap as morning temperatures will plunge to minus 10 degrees towards the end of the week. On to Tuesday's readings. Seoul mix it to minus 1, Daegu and Gwangju hits 7. On to other regions, Jeju reaches 10, Bukdo hits 8, Mount Kumgang minus 6. That's all I have for you now, and I'll be back with more after midnight. See you then. Thanks, Po Gyeong, and that's primetime news for this Monday. I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for watching. And I'm Kang Chedi. Have a great evening. We'll see you again soon.